welcome to our panel, Experimental Research Design and Online Panel. Uh, this panel is being uh, sponsored by the Association of North America Higher Education International and also University of South Florida, Sarasota Manatee, M3 Center for Hospital Technology and Innovation. My name is Dr. Jihan Chobanolo. I'm the McKibben Endowed Chair uh, professor at the USF Sarasota Manatee. Also, I direct the M3 Center. Uh, also, I serve currently as the president of Association of North America Higher Education International. I would like to introduce our panelists to you. We have Dr. Lawrence Hortman Fong. Uh, from, he is the assistant professor of international integrated resort management at the University of Macau. I had the pleasure actually to meet him when I was in Macau a couple of months ago. Uh, that was a so nice tour also, Lawrence, thank you uh, as well. Um, and next, uh, as a panelist, uh, we have Dr. Sarah uh, Lefebvre. I hope I didn't mispronounce it, uh, your last name. Sarah, uh, she's an assistant professor at Murray State University, and she uh, focuses on sensory aspects of food and beverage products, emerging food trends, and health and wellness. Uh, also welcome Sarah to the panel. And uh, Dr. J. Michaels, um, actually it's a great honor also to have him on this panel uh, because he's from University of South Florida, Sarasota Manatee here, as a background on experimental quantitative social psychology, and he has done a lot of experimental research um, there. And moderator is going to be Dr. Faisan Ali. He's the assistant professor uh, at the College of Hospitality, Tourism, Leadership here at University of South Florida, Sarasota Manatee, and he's serving as uh, assistant editor for IJCHM and coordinating editor uh, for IJHM and also associate editor for IBO Journal and also director of research for ANEHE. And also he's the coordinator for M3 Center as well. Experimental research design. design. The idea was, uh, I understand that in marketing and psychology, this is something that has been happening for a long time, like experimental research. But in hospitality and tourism, it is not that common. I mean, people are doing it, but it's not really mainstream. I mean, we normally work with SEM and stuff like that. So um, recently, I went to some conferences where people have been talking about it a little bit. So I thought it's a good idea to bring people from dis different disciplines and let them talk about this uh, research method and why they use it, what are the benefits, what are the limitations, uh, and stuff like this. Uh, and because of this, we had to get people from different disciplines. So we have Dr. Sarah, who is from marketing. Uh, we have Dr. Jay, who is from psychology, and Dr. Lawrence, who is in hospitality and tourism. Uh, the basic format would be, I'm going to, uh, you know, stop talking very soon. And I'll let each of the panelists to talk about 10 to 12 minutes about their research using experimental research design. Uh, one of their research papers that they've recently worked on, why did they uh, use experimental research and what benefits did it bring to them? Uh, you, you know, so after each panelist is done, then we have a list of questions that uh, I have. I'm going to ask uh, randomly, you know, and each panelist will answer them. And then we'll take the questions from our audience. So right now we have like 40 people on Zoom and I think 20 something on Facebook who are watching live. So, uh, you know, uh, since it's very early in the US, many people are coming into their offices. So we might have more people going forward into the panel. So with that, uh, I think uh, we can just start our panel discussion. Uh, Okay, so because my field is hospitality, so I think I will not ask Dr. Lawrence to start first. Maybe we should ask Dr. Sarah. And again, Jay, I'm not asking you to start because you are also sort of a host. You are at USFSM. So we'll be hospitable and ask Dr. Sarah to start. And All right, Sarah, so the floor is all yours. All right, well, thank you uh, very much for having me today. Um, so I'm in the discipline of marketing, so I wanted to start a little bit giving you an insight into what experimental research is like for us in marketing. I'm trained in consumer behavior where experimental design is really the predominant method that's used in terms of testing theory. So in particular, I work mostly with food and beverage products 
where in developing theory, I use different sorts of experiments. There's many different methods in terms of experiments that um, I use across the board, really to help in terms of, again, testing theory, developing new tools um, across the board. So in marketing, the traditional sort of method in a manuscript that is experimental would be what we call the three study model, where your first experiment is going to be showing a main effect, the main outcome that you're looking at, followed by a second study that will be showing some form of process evidence, usually for mediation, and then a third study that's going to show moderation. That's kind of what the traditional, what I would call the traditional model is for a consumer behavior paper in the marketing field. That's sort of adapted um, in the last few years. We're seeing our premier journals having in manuscripts with more like five, six, I've even seen some with eight experiments in the papers now. Part of that is a reflection of greater expectations from reviewers to not only demonstrate the underlying process, but to also rule out alternative, multiple alternative explanations and multiple moderators. So it's kind of grown into this uh, many study type of paper in a lot of the marketing journals. However, I will say that there's still the opportunity and the um, appreciation for simple, clear design studies that still have very strong rigor in them. And I'm a big believer in that you don't have to have a very complex design in your research um, or in your experiment in general, it just needs to be done in a very rigorous way that allows you to have some creativity. So that would be my other big thing with experimental design is that I like to say it's a mix of art and science. There's an of creativity that you have to have in your experimental design, particularly for me working with food and bev in a way that is not going to influence consumers' behavior in the experiment itself, that's definitely an area where I get to use a lot of creativity um, to create the manipulations of your, of your different variables. So it's kind of a little bit of um, a background on where we're at in marketing, where experimental design is really prominent. It's kind of the norm um, for us. The other big thing, Thing that I kind of wanted to touch on that's changing or developing experimental design in marketing is the increased use of online marketplaces for data collection. This is being driven predominantly by the use of Amazon Mechanical Turk or MTurk um, as it's commonly known as well. So online data collection, though it's been used over the last 10 years across the social sciences, in marketing, it's seen a massive growth within the last five years because of MTurk. So we're actually seeing in our top level journals now, in the last year, I would say that there are manuscripts being published that only use online data collection. So this is kind of a change that's occurring and that also affects your experimental design because you have limitations, of course, in that online environment particularly for me as a food and beverage researcher, that's somewhere you really have to use a lot of creativity, a lot of different methods, if you're gonna use some kind of online panel for anything to do with food and bev. So for those who aren't familiar, because I know that uh, MTurk is not as common across the disciplines, um, basic idea is that it's an online platform where Amazon takes care of recruitment for you, as well as paying or compensating your participants after the study is done. So you pay upfront, they take care of the payment once it's complete. Um, and you use a third party hosting site for your survey. So usually Qualtrics, SurveyMonkey, whatever you might be doing to host your actual survey or your experiment. And Again, they help you with recruitment and in administering that actual survey or experiment to your, to your participants. Now, the growth 
in mTORC that we're seeing has kind of been coupled with the acceptance. Um, in more and more journals, as I was saying, we're seeing papers that are only using online data collection. So there is more of an acceptance. And part of that is because a lot of the challenges that we are seeing with online platforms like participant misrepresentation, so not really being who they say they are, or self-selection, they only want to do certain types of studies, or even things like their level of involvement. So are they multitasking? Are they doing three servers at once? We're seeing and developing more and more techniques to help control for those elements, and that's really increased the quality of data that we're getting. So I think that it's going to continue to grow. I know in hospitality, they're starting to see more mTurk use, um, and I think it's going to follow across the discipline. So that's something that we need to be conscious of um, in terms of experimental design when we're creating our, our research projects. So that kind of leads into the study that I wanted to present. If I have time, I might present two, um, just because I think it demonstrates how we can assess or look at a research question in an online environment as well as in a environment, which is where I spend a lot of my time. Um, but particularly, this is a good demonstration for doing a food and bev type of study um, using mTurk. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, so this research um, project was really looking at the overarching question of how does consumer involvement in food preparation influence their perceived healthiness. So what we were wondering was, as you're more involved, you actually start to perceive that food as being healthier for you because it's customized for you. It's exactly what you want. So pretty basic um, idea that started this. And we went to mTurk initially uh, because it was an available sample. That's one of the benefits with um, mTurk is the accessibility. It's there all of the time. So we recruited 100 and 10 participants um, from mTurk. Usually your sample is pretty good representation. Now you can put um, eligibility criteria on there to only have maybe you just want women, maybe you want people within a certain age range. We went for a more general um, population here for a general sample. So that's what we have. Now, what we wanted to look at again in this was their level of involvement, how it influenced perceptions of healthiness. So very basic experimental design here, a simple single factor, which was their level of involvement. And we had two levels, a low level of involvement and a high level of involvement. And as an as a indirect measure of healthiness, we were using their calorie content perceptions of the food. So we selected the food to be trail mix, um, pretty neutral in terms of healthiness and unhealthiness perceptions. So the trick here was, and this is where that creative element comes in that I was talking about, is how do we manipulate someone's level of involvement in preparing a food in an online environment where they don't actually touch food? How are we going to do this? So what we did was we gave them a scenario to begin where they were told that, imagine you'd ordered a snack item from an online food retailer, um, you've selected the trail mix you want, and your items that you um, want to receive. Your package arrives with the trail mix. You remove the jar from the box, read the summary information. So the key here was this is the low involvement condition. So they read this in that particular condition. They would read this and see the jar of trail mix. They were told they took that jar out, told what was in it, and then simply to enjoy it. So this would have been low involvement. In the high involvement condition, we told them the same basic scenario, but we told them when the package arrived, it arrived with all of your individual ingredients partitioned out, as you can see in the image, in these individual little cups. Here, they were told that they need to combine the ingredients and mix well. So again, starting to manipulate that level of involvement, but we needed to take it a little bit more, uh, a little bit stronger in terms of the manipulation. So we were able to use the drag and drop feature on Qualtrics. And in the low involvement condition, we simply told them to drag the jar into the box and that would represent putting it into a bowl for them. Whereas in the high involvement condition, they had to drag and drop each ingredient into the box on the right in order to 
put the ingredients in the bowl um, to be mixed and for them to enjoy. So that's how we manipulated their level of involvement was through that dragging of each ingredient versus just the single drag for the, uh, when the, it was in the jar and the low involvement. And then both conditions saw their completed bowl of trail mix and were asked, how many calories do you think the trail mix has? Very little versus a lot. So really here, again, very simple and basic experimental design, but implementing that level of creativity in how we were gonna manipulate it in an online environment. So if you're interested, what we did see is that in the low involvement condition, they do perceive it um, as having a lot more calories, significantly more calories when they're not involved in the preparation versus in the high involvement condition um, when they're actually making it themselves, they think it's healthier. So really quick, because I know I'm talking a lot, but I wanted to compare this to some to what we did in the in the actual lab environment where we were able to work with a student sample. So a lot easier to deal with food products when we're in a live environment. We have um, the ability to change the environment a little much more easily than we do in the online. So in this case, we used um, 70 participants. These were our student sample here at Murray State. Kept the same experimental design, just simple, um, single factor with two levels. And in this case, what we did was we used um, brownies as the experimental stimuli. So what they had to do is, if you look at the box on the left, this was the low involvement condition. So they received a brownie with chocolate frosting. It was already ready for them. They were simply told to take it from the box, enjoy it, and then rate the amount of calories they thought were in it. Whereas on the right, you see the high involvement condition where they were given the brownie unfrosted and the frosting was given in the little uh, cup beside it with a spatula. They were told to frost it themselves. And we did maintain the amount of frosting that is on the already prepared versus what's in the cup. There's the exact same amount of frosting in both of them. So that was another thing. And that's another thing, important experimental design, keeping things as consistent as possible across the conditions. So in this case, that's how we manipulated it, was their actual being able to frost the brownie versus not. And then if you're interested, here we use their actual estimate in an open-ended question for calories, and we see that same effect coming through where if you have low involvement, you perceive there being more calories than if you have high involvement. So, I, I know that was a really quick snapshot of two studies, but I hope it kind of demonstrates in different experimental environments, you still have the ability to have strong manipulations in a simple design that can still communicate what your theory might be and what your story is behind your research. It doesn't need to be super complex. As long as it's, again, interesting and, and rigorous, you can um, get through it. So that's what I have for you. Okay. Yes, I, I actually cut off a little bit. So, okay. Um, yeah, Sarah, very interesting. Actually, I was very interested in the last one that you explained this brownie with the thing on top. Very, I mean, we have been talking about something similar recently, like me and Dr. Jehan, but very interesting. So I'll not ask questions right now. I'll leave it to the end. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll ask the other panelists. Maybe we can go with uh, Dr. J. Michaels so that he can explain some stuff about his research. Sarah, I would just want you to uh, stop sharing the screen uh, so that uh, Jay can easily share his screen. Thank you so much. Oh, so I guess a good Thursday, everybody. And uh, I want to thank uh, Faizan and Gihan for uh, inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, if I recall, uh, the first question was, you know, what motivated me to kind of go into an experimental direction um, with research? and for me, it was actually rather accidental. I mean, my academic background started out as an undergraduate um, across psychology, sociology, and history. And even before I settled on those particular majors, I was uh, actually a meteorology major for a while. Um, so my first research is actually in tornado prediction using Doppler radar technology of all things. Um, what I appreciated though by having such a diverse background is I recognized the different techniques that people in different disciplines use to address questions. 
And I would like to address that, you know, people sometimes think that science is best, has all the answers. I don't think that's the case. It's just a different lens. So what I mean by that is in history, you rely on existing documents and you try to sift through a vast wealth of knowledge and past information to try to see where is the convergent evidence? Where does everything kind of point to a singular conclusion about some phenomena that's happened in the past? The issue with that, of course, is we can't kind of time travel into the past to collect new data. We can't go and perform any manipulations to test whether or not our assumptions are correct. So for me, what I find is that science based on experimental research, it has this objectivity. And that is useful, especially in the domains of research that involve anything to do with people. For the simple reason of this, my colleagues in physics or biology, they might be study, studying like blood stem cell interactions or some new particle properties. Well, they can isolate these things outside of themselves and outside of their mind. But when we study people, we can't separate ourselves from our humanity. So we always are kind of victim, if you will, to these cognitive heuristics, they're called, these mental shortcuts to make judgments and assumptions. Scientific methods and experimental methodology helps us to break free of those pre-existing assumptions we may carry and rely more on the objective facts, at least if it's well-designed research. So that's a little bit of background about my motivation um, for research. As Dr. Sarah was explaining, um, technology and the way we conduct research with experiments these days is fast changing. So for, for everybody who's listening, I'd just like to kind of make you aware of some of the changes that are likely to affect most fields, um, especially those that are in the kind of the social sciences domain, like hospitality and business. Um, one of these is a concern of what's called research power. So in psychology, it's become normal to perform something called a power analysis before you even carry out a research study, um, especially with experimental methodology. And the goal with a power analysis is to be able to ascertain that you have a sufficient sample size to reliably detect the results. So why that's important is that we can never be 100% certain that the outcome from an experiment is a direct cause of our manipulation, such as the amount of perhaps, I don't know, frosting on a cupcake or if somebody prepared it or not, or in my research, if a person perhaps experiences a conflict scenario, we never quite know what, if what we've done actually yielded the response that we're measuring. So a power analysis helps us determine what is the minimum sample size we really need to be able to know with a reasonable amount of certainty that it's our manipulations in a research study and an experiment that yield the result. Um, an important note on that is that experimental methodologies really differ from other techniques in that they do involve some sort of a manipulation. Whereas a lot of research perhaps on, you know, preference or calorie perception for different foods or perception of what causes a more destructive type of conflict, if we use survey methods, this will tell us certain information, um, but it won't allow us to identify clear cause and effect. So that's why we rely on some experimental methodology. Um, so with these things kind of said about some of my background, what I'd like to actually do is tell you about uh, one of the studies I, I had a lot of fun with and it was really quite challenging to go from a theoretical perspective to one that is more experimental. And this is one of my original studies on human conflict. So I'm going to go ahead and do a screen share here. Cool. And there we go. It's thinking. So the research question that, that motivated this particular study was, can we escape conflict by establishing agreement? And across the conflict literature, what we really recognize is that there's this assumption that the avenue out of a conflict is to have both sides come together, try to work it out, try to establish this sense of agreement. You see this in, for example, Osgood's famous grit strategy, where when you have two adversaries locked in a dispute, it may be best for one adversary to concede and say, you know what, I'm sorry, here's a concession, can we work this out? Um, if anyone's familiar with the classic cartoon, The Peanuts, from back in the 60s, 
there's this one episode um, for one of the holiday episodes, the Halloween episode, where Linus, the character that's pictured on the screen, decides to go out into a pumpkin patch all night long to await this mythical great pumpkin. And all of his friends think this is the most foolish thing, and it creates this kind of dispute between Linus and all of his friends. And he quotes, um, the, there are three things I have learned never to discuss with people, religion, politics, and the great pumpkin. As everyone I think knows, uh, religion and politics are a common um, start for a lot of conflicts. So this research um, ended up being published in a couple different domains that I, I kind of was shown here. And the kind of core theoretical background is that conflict really stems from some sort of a belief incompatibility that leads to a sense of negativity, strong negative emotions, and a perception of competition. So a common assumption that people have, whether in the scholastic fields or just, you know, any typical person you may encounter in life, there's this assumption that to escape conflict, what people need to do is change their attitudes. They have to be able to say, you know what, maybe some of my perspectives were wrong and you're correct. And if people change their attitudes to concede to an opponent and kind of establish a sense of similarity, this can evoke a sense of compatibility and cooperation. Well. The problem is that disagreements often prove stubborn, and they might even lead to a stronger new conflict, even if agreement is established. And we know from research, an extensive amount of research, that this is because there's an asymmetric reaction to negative events. Overwhelmingly, people, just because of how our brains are wired, we react more strongly to negative information than to positive information. We're all aware of this implicitly. If you just watch the evening news or go read a news website, guarantee most of what you read or see is going to be negative. Part of that reason is it captures your attention far more strongly than positive information. So what we end up seeing with this is, is the prediction I ended up making from this background is that people present this asymmetric reaction, both cognitively in terms of their attitudes and in terms of their emotions, which is the affective domain of psychology, um, when they experience disagreement versus agreement. So when people experience a disagreement, something kind of conflicting, this is far more provoking of a reaction than agreement. And this provocation is going to lead to an instability in people's attitudes. When you encounter some sudden disagreement about something, people tend to shift the way they think. They're trying to understand, whoa, what's going on here? Did I do something wrong? This will also lead to more negative emotions. The other prediction that's rather unintuitive from the conflict research is that simple agreement alone can't override this attitude change in negativity. That once the disagreement sets in, it becomes something that's rather stubborn. So these were some of the predictions, some of the background I had, and I had to design an experimental study around this. And the experimental study I designed became one of the first studies to look at both how attitudes and emotional states evolve over time in a real interaction. So here's how I set up the study. I recognize that people's attitudes, they might show some degree of change that's just endemic to the person. There are some people who have these very firm attitudes, they resist any information, they have this very strong set of kind of opinions, if you want to say so. Then there are other people that in some ways are a bit more flexible, they're more fluid, they consider multiple perspectives naturally. So in order to account for the individual ways that people's attitudes function, it was important to measure the attitudes up front, and this is establishing a baseline. So by obtaining a baseline in an experiment of whatever you're interested in, whether attitudes, emotions, people's sense of self-control, or their perception of calories, their reaction to different hotel advertising, whatever it may be, if you want to be able to control for all of the vast individual differences people possess, you want to obtain a baseline first. Now, after the baseline, I used the information about how people had their attitudes toward different statements to set up a script for a research assistant to follow during the interaction. And by looking at people's attitudes, we knew what they agreed with and what they disagreed with. So by knowing this information, what I was able to do in the study is set up scenarios where people would interact with an actor, a confederate, who would express attitudes that were similar. Oh yeah, I agree with you. Yes, I think that Pepsi is the better uh, cola than Coke, for example. Or 
nuclear weapons. Yeah, I don't think there's something we really need to protect our nation. So these type of things. In another situation, though, people could disagree. If they were discussing an attitude about a soft beverage or soft drink preference, if somebody said, you know, I think Coke is the better product. Well, the other person to evoke disagreement could say, no, I disagree with you. Pepsi is better, right? And this was a controlled experiment. It involved video recording, some nuances that I won't get too deep into. So the way it worked is people came to the lab and the first session was to just get the baseline. And on the right of your screen, you could see some of the uh, sample questions and how people reacted. For this study, I'm most interested in their uh, level of agreement or disagreement, which is the very first response on the Likert scale there. After generating the script, people returned to the lab for this interaction. We're using the pre-existing information about people's attitudes. The trained Confederates, the actors posing as participants could evoke a sense of cooperation or conflict. So what this shows are, are the different conditions that I had. In a good experimental design, you'll always have a control. So the control is the condition where people are not exposed to the manipulation. For this study, in the control scenario, people came to the lab and they took turns reading the different statements. So things like Pepsi is better than Coke. They just read that and nobody ever told one another, the participant nor the Confederate, whether they agreed with it or disagreed with it. So that eliminates the sense of agreement or disagreement. Then I had a scenario where they completely cooperated. They came to the lab and the Confederate, the actor, seemed to share all the same attitudes as the participant. Vice versa, I had another scenario where they seemed to be just polar opposite on every single attitude. And then finally, most interestingly, I had a couple of studies where the interaction began with agreement, cooperation, but midway through the, the Confederate, the actor started disagreeing with everything. It's as if the switch was turned. And the other scenario that was analogous to this, just opposite, is the interaction began with the sense of competition, polar opposites in terms of attitudes, but then it shifted into one where all of a sudden, the Confederates seemed to be given in and saying, no, you're right, I agree with that attitude. And that's very similar to what we would predict about how to resolve a conflict, that we start to evoke cooperation that yields um, some effect. So there's all kinds of different interesting ways to measure your data. I'm not going to get into the details of this. If anyone's interested, I'm happy to elaborate. Um, but as you could see just from these slides that with experimental designs, the design itself is only one component of the study. In addition to the design, you have to really carefully think about how you measure your data as well as how you analyze it. And this is non-trivial. It's something that is really quite complex, which is why I advocate for interdisciplinary research teams. Invite a statistician to be able to be a part of your study or someone who has trained in experimental methods. But here's some of the interesting results. First of all, people's attitude change. So on the left axis where you see the zero, zero reflects that from the baseline where they first came to the study versus when they had the interaction. If the score is around zero, it means their attitudes had absolutely no change whatsoever. If the change is negative, this is indicating that they became more stable. The attitudes ended up showing really little response to the interaction. If the values are positive, what this is showing is that from the initial interaction, or rather before the interaction, to the period of time after the interaction took place, this shows where people's attitudes started to show instability. So what we see from this data, going from left to right, looking at the uh, different blue kind of dots with the bars, um, in the control, in the cooperation, and interestingly in the competition, the kind of conflict alone scenarios, people don't show much of an attitude reaction. So that was an interesting finding because it shows that simple disagreement. If you encounter someone who has polar opposite attitudes and is a stranger to you, that doesn't really phase people. Um, however, what's interesting in the condition, the interaction type labeled PN, this is going from the positive kind of cooperative scenario to the negative conflict ridden scenario what we see is the statistically significant increase in the attitude fluctuation. That when some sort of a disagreement all of a sudden crops up in an interaction, people mentally start to have this perturbation, their attitudes start to change. Now, we would think that in a situation where you have this initial disagreement, this negativity in an interaction, if you evoke agreement and if people are going to show concession, try to come together, they should show attitude change as well. But in the far right, the one labeled NP, 
we don't see that as the case at all. In terms of emotions, <clears throat> what we see here is values below zero indicate that people experience the interaction as more negative. And what we see in this case is the only one that's statistically more negative is the situation where sudden disagreement, the PN labeled one right here, we see that's the only scenario that evokes this strong negativity in people. So again, conflict alone doesn't evoke negativity. It seems to be more it's the loss of the agreement, the loss of the similarity that evokes the strong attitude reaction and the accompanying negativity. Again, there are all kinds of complex statistical analyses, but the key finding from this is not intuitive, is that conflict reduction strategies that involve initiating this unilateral agreement, just one person trying to give in and concede, they actually might not be so effective. The reason for this is that people react very strongly to disagreement, but agreement, this is something we kind of are conditioned to expect from the world, so we show less reaction. Um, this is something that's significantly influenced by these complex psychological dynamics. Now, one factor that may play a role here is the experiment has limitations. This was a really benign interaction, and what we may see are even stronger effects if this were more meaningful. So we're all familiar with this. If you were to get like a parking ticket, for example, or a ticket for parking illegally, this might upset us a little bit, but it's not likely to cause us to react in this extraordinarily strong way. Whereas if we have the threat of a relationship falling apart and people separating, that's something that may cause us a lot of anguish and a lot of negativity. So for future studies, this would be something people should look at. In any event, um, what I kind of just want to impart by this in this kind of brief discussion is that experimental methodology has a lot of steps. It's about understanding how to translate your theory to specific techniques to try to get at the result you're looking for, the phenomenon that you're, you're studying. But you have to also think ahead to what statistics will you use to actually analyze the data. And real briefly, my last comment on that is that I've done plenty of studies where after the fact, I was really regretting my experimental design because the statistics I needed were just incredibly cumbersome and complex. Uh, so I agree with Dr. Sarah, sometimes the best design is a simpler one. So with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Hassan. Thank you very much, Jay. I have a couple of other interesting questions for you, but as I said, let's, let's leave all the questions to the end. Um, and uh, Lawrence, so uh, I'll, uh, invite you to talk about it but before that i really want to thank you because uh, you are in macau and it's i guess 13 hours of difference so right now i guess it's close to 11 pm there so thank you for agreeing to be part of the panel please go ahead okay thank you Faisal. all right uh yes it's uh, uh about uh, almost 11 but uh, still i'm i'm still energetic actually yeah so um this is uh, lawrence uh, from the university of macau and then uh, I think I'm not going to talk too much about uh, what's experiment and also some of my opinion related to experiment because uh, Sarah and Jay actually share a lot. And then uh, I just want to highlight two points. First of all is why do I want to do experiment? The motivation. I still remember that from day one, why I do experiment actually is uh, I find that it is really interesting, especially when I'm designing the experiment. Yeah, of course, if I can find the results that I hypothesize, that would be very exciting. Yeah, that's the reason why I just keep me doing experiment, even though I'm also doing survey as well. And um, another thing I want to highlight is, uh, which is more related to uh, our field, uh, hospitality and also tourism. Because uh, actually we always highlight uh, the applied, uh, uh, applied, of the sci applied science, actually we have to provide some practical implications uh, for the practitioners. This is something which is uh, always emphasized. Uh, for example, the reviewers as well. Even though what we are doing is, uh, for example, uh, quite similar to like uh, marketing research, actually, um, uh, if we don't talk too much about our practical implications, for sure, I think the reviewers will criticize that. I think this is uh, quite unique uh, to the field of hospitality and also tourism. And I also echo Faison's uh, early uh, remark about uh, actually um, not many researchers here in uh, hospitality and tourism will do experiment. Uh, actually, I tried to uh, review some of the articles uh, 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 in hospitality and also tourism, 
And I found that actually, uh, only we, more people are doing experiment only starting from 2005. But uh, in recent year, actually, we are uh, doing more. And then I can see more uh, people doing experiment in uh, hospitality. And then which is also trying to uh, uh, following the train of uh, uh, consumer research and also market, which is uh, actually uh, what they're doing is uh, very similar in terms of the practice. All right, so um, maybe I just uh, start my presentation of the study, uh, which is, I, I, and one more thing is, uh, which is I also agree with is uh, uh, experiment actually needs not to be complicated. Uh, a simple one and a minimal, meaningful one would be important. All right, now I'm going to share the screen. All right. Can you see it? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yeah, yes, Perfect. yes. All right, that's fine. Okay, thank you. I just make sure that there's no technical problem. <laughs> All right, this is our campus. Yeah, and then you're welcome to come to here. All right, and then um, today uh, I've got three agenda items. Uh, the study that I'm going to talk about is uh, related to restaurant coupon promotion. Uh, because uh, we are talking about hospitality, that's why I, uh, we try to choose restaurant. And then uh, after I talk about the study, and then uh, I'll try to raise some questions, what else can be done on top of this study. And eventually I will try to share some of my observations of uh, experimental research in hospitality and tourism. All right. Hospitality management, because uh, we want to do an experiment in a hospitality uh, context, that's why we, uh, finally we decided to choose a restaurant. Uh, which is actually commonly used in experimental design here in the field. As I mentioned before, uh, of course, theoretical significance is very important uh, because we are doing research, but uh, practical significance are also equally important. This is uh, my opinion because we are in the field of uh, hospitality. And this time uh, we choose to do an uh, experiment related to coupon promotion. First of all, I'll just give you a very brief background why uh, we do the coupon promotion experiment. Actually, because we found that it is a very instrumental, very helpful, even though this is quite an old fashioned uh, uh, promotional uh, uh, method. Right? However, it, uh, it is very important for uh, those newly open restaurants because it helps to draw in some uh, uh, customers to try uh, the, uh, the restaurants and also the products. And then most of the time when we just look at the queue points, if we would have, if you can enjoy like 20% uh, off discount uh, compared to another one, which we can only enjoy 10% off discount for sure, 20% off would be more attractive from the consumer's point of view. But would it be more effective? Actually, not quite sure. It also depends on the cost as well. Anyway, uh, monetary saving by using a coupon actually is uh, uh, something that which is uh, always used by the practitioners. And then and it has been tested in the uh, previous research. So in this case, what we want to do is trying to find other variables on, uh, other than monetary savings. What else can be done? And then what we are going to try is actually freedom to choose. Whether we, can uh, we have the freedom to choose the incentive or not. And then here I want to explain what it means is, uh, for example, we have a 20% off discount for, in a restaurant, let's say for coffee, for any kinds of drinks, or only for, let's say, juice. Okay? If it is only for juice, that means there's no freedom of choice in terms of the incentive. But if we can choose any kinds of drinks, then there will be a freedom of choice. And then we will try to see whether uh, it is uh, effective or not. And also trying to see whether it will be more effective than a monetary savings. And also trying to see how it's going to interact with a monetary saving. Okay. As I mentioned before, there are two major constructs. One is a monetary savings, and another one is a freedom to choose an incentive. Uh, in order to see whether people like it or not, actually, uh, we have to see whether people has intention to use the coupon with these characteristics. And then uh, we know that theory of plan behavior saying that attitude is, uh, uh, is an antecedent of intention to use. That's the reason why we propose that this will be a mediator. And then uh, that's why the monetary saving will affect the attitude and then intention. And then uh, we expect that actually the freedom to choose incentive will moderate this uh, relationship. That's the reason why we are going to have a moderated mediation model. Could be a very straightforward and simple one, right? Just uh, for demonstration. And then, um, so how we are going to do it, actually we recruit 124 students uh, through uh, the sonar system that we have in the University of Macau. Uh, uh, just to briefly explain what it is actually, uh, I, 
for sure, I think Sarah and Jay would know what it is because uh, um, it is very common to use it. Uh, actually, in, uh, in our university, actually, we have a large pool of students already registered on Sonar. Actually, every time we just uh, uh, make an announcement and then call for participation in our experiment uh, through the Sonar system. And uh, uh, like Sarah mentioned, actually, we, I also use uh, Quadrix to design the uh, uh, survey and also experiment for data collection. And we did it in a computer lab, which is a control environment. And very straightforward and simple way is trying to give a scenario to the uh, students, to the participants, which is a new sandwich house is going to be open in the campus and they are going to receive a coupon. Uh, we want to put it in the campus because they are the students and then we, so that it would be more relevant to them. Yeah, as I mentioned before, actually uh, practical implication is also important, but because we are doing in, doing in the lab, uh, we try to put it in a way which is more relevant to the participants. And then uh, we're seeing that actually the sandwich house is called Osley Sandwich, uh, but this name actually is uh, fictitious. Of course, it's not real because we try to rule out any brand effect. It's a two by two between subject design because we have two variables and then we are going to have two levels uh, for each variable. And for the Q point, actually, we are going to use a black and white color because we believe that actually the color will have some effect on the response of the uh, participants, trying to rule out some of the color effect. Uh, one variable actually is a monetary saving. We have a high and low uh, situations. Another one is the freedom to choose incentive, yes and no. So there will be, because of a two by two between subject design, there will be four conditions. One is uh, here is monetary saving is low. And that uh, here uh, we put a $5 off actually by using this kill point uh, to buy the sandwich combo. However, there's no choice in terms of the sandwich combo because it's a selected one. Another one actually is a $15 off. Uh, here I want to mention one thing is uh, usually in Macau, actually my understanding is if we, if we really want to buy a sandwich combo, it may cost around $40. So $5 of course is a small amount and $15 would be higher. And then uh, for the third condition actually is uh, the low saving and also with Troy. The last one is, would be more, uh, seems to be most attractive uh, from the consumer, consumer's point of view because they can save a lot and also they have a choice on the sandwich combo. I just mentioned that we have 124 participants. We randomly assign them to the four conditions. And eventually we've got 31 in each condition. Uh, of course, we have to measure uh, uh, the constructs as well uh, because when we, uh, monetary saving actually is manipulated. We do the manipulation check, ask them uh, one item, which is whether they are able to save a lot of money if they use a kill point. One not, actually seven is yes. Right? Like uh, monetary saving, freedom to choose incentive, we also do the manipulation check as well. Uh, the choice on the sandwich combo, which they could buy with the kill point, not or yes, All right? from one to seven. And for attitude towards the Q point, we use our three items to measure it. Uh, Converge alpha 0 0.906, which is far above uh, 0 0.7. Intention, also use our three items to measure it. And we also need to think about some of the control variables. And then first of all, is according to the literature, Q point proneness. That means uh, people, have, whether they have a tendency to use a Q point or not, which will affect people's intention to use it. So we try to borrow the scale from uh, a peer study and Converge alpha is good. And another thing we speculate that actually, uh, if people are more likely to buy sandwich, it seems they are more likely to use the kill point. So that's why we also think that sandwich purchase frequency is a control variable. And gender is a very common one to be a control variable, even according to the literature. And the manipulation check is passed uh, because it's a two by two design. Actually, uh, we have the one or two, uh, two way and over. And then we found that actually in the freedom to choose conditions, in the low choice condition, the mean is at 3.47 with choice actually 5.16, uh, which is uh, statistically significant. And then uh, when we are trying to test it, uh, whether uh, actually the manipulation uh, of a monetary saving will affect the measures of the choice or not, actually it's not significant. And also their interaction is not significant as well. In this way, that means uh, the manipulation check is passed. And same logic for uh, monetary saving. Low saving, 4.35, uh, the mean is. And also high saving is 5.04. Uh, 06 actually is a, uh, significant. To test the model, actually what we use is a process. Uh, I think it is uh, quite common, especially right now uh, uh, in experimental design, in marketing, right? And then uh, 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 we try to use a version three 
uh, of course, uh, for this kind of model, actually, uh, 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 in Hayes, actually, we can use a uh, model seven to do it. Uh, however, when, uh, when we find an inversion field, actually, uh, the covariance will also affect the mediator. That's why we try to customize the model. And then, so that it would only affect uh, intention to use coupon. And then we find that actually the interaction effect is significant. And also attitude really positively affect, uh, uh, associated with intention. And now, first of all, let us uh, look at the interaction effect in detail. Still remember that at the beginning of my presentation, I raised three questions. One is, uh, is freedom to choose incentive effective or not? And then the main effect tells us that actually, yes. And then is it more effective than monetary saving? Uh, we try to see the main effect of a monetary saving. Actually, monetary saving, of course, also is significant, but uh, compared to uh, freedom to choose, actually, is less, uh, is less significant. Okay. And then it seems, yes. And how about the interaction, which is also significant? Uh, to decompose the interaction, uh, you may read the uh, chart here. We may read the chart here. Here, uh, x-axis is uh, monetary saving, low saving, and high saving. This is the attitude. All right, and then for the freedom to choose, actually the blue line stands for low choice, and then the orange line is a cho uh, with choice. Uh, what we can see here is only under the low choice situations, and then uh, the uh, monetary saving has a significant effect. All right, that means if there is no freedom to choose an incentive, monetary saving actually is important. Uh, if there, uh, however, if uh, there is a choice, and then it means that actually monetary saving is not significant. And what I want you uh, uh, to attend, what I want you to attend to actually is here and also here. For example, this one is a low saving and also uh, with choice. And then this one actually is a high saving and then without choice. So it's, uh, what we can see actually they are here, they are actually not uh, statistically significant, no significant, all right, not significant. And then there will be an implication for the practitioners, okay? And then we have to think about the cause. The cost of offering the freedom of choice and the cost of having a higher saving, which one is higher? All right. If the cost of the free, offering freedom of choice actually is lower, why not we go for this one? Because actually they are equally effective. All right. So this could be something which would be relevant to the practitioners. All right. Moderator mediation. We just talked about it. Actually, we just uh, finished talking about the moderation effect here between these three variables. And what we want to see whether there is any more, uh, whether it would need to intention or not. So that's why uh, we check the index of moderator mediation. You can see the confidence interval actually doesn't include any zero. It means that it is significant. And then how it is, when there's no choice, the indirect effect is significant. When there's a choice, indirect effect is not significant. All right, I'm not going to talk about it again, all right, uh, because of time limitation. And then after we finish this project, and then actually we have to think about what else we can do. Uh, we understand that actually in marketing, in psychology, it's a very common to have multiple studies. Right? As Sarah just mentioned that actually we, uh, in marketing, JCR, all right, and we can have seven, eight studies, all right. Uh, but what my observation actually is uh, here in hospitality, actually, uh, still multiple studies are not very, very common. But what we can see is over the last two years, what I can, when I read the hospitality journals, there are more people uh, doing multiple studies. And then, so, uh, but why do we need to do multiple studies? Actually, for example, just now I finished one study and then there could be pitfalls. There could be some other arguments where, uh, which argue that actually uh, the, the results may not be that perfect. There would be some problem and then perhaps we have to do it again, all right? So, and then what other variables can be test? What other variables can be controlled? This is something we have to think about in the future studies, in the next, next studies, not future studies. Okay. Other possible moderators? other possible mediators. And then we just do it in the lab. How about doing it in the field experiment? That could be very important because uh, especially in the field here, because uh, of the practical implication is significant, is very important, right? Uh, of course, when we are doing field experiment, we have to sacrifice the uh, uh, internal validity. And then uh, uh, we just test it among those uh, student samples. Even we try to put it in the context of a com uh, campus restaurant, uh, if possible, we better do it with a, a, a sample with uh, non-students and even trying to do it in other countries because it, uh, it was done in Macau, there are many Chinese. And uh, we can also do, uh, yeah, do it on an online experiment uh, using some of the crowdsourcing sites like Amtrak. Actually, I'm also using Amtrak to do experiment. Uh, 
uh, uh, because Cortex amateurs actually they can be linked together and they would, oh, it's really, really efficient. I really love it. Yeah. And then uh, another one actually is uh, WJX. WJX actually, if you're going to collect the data um, of, of about for Chinese samples, that would be uh, useful. And uh, more importantly, actually, is uh, no matter Quadrix or WJX, actually, they have a built-in random assignment function. Yeah, so I think this would be very important to uh, as my method design. So based on these question, the conclusion actually is we better do multiple studies. And then finally, I just want to share my observations uh, uh, in the field of hospitality and tourism. Actually, this is a paper, uh, which is a review paper, uh, which was published in 2016 uh, by me and also my co-authors as well in the uh, IJCHM. And then uh, we try to review uh, the tourism and also hospitality studies uh, using experimental design uh, over the years. Uh, what you can see in the very early period, there's not, not many. All right, but uh, in recent years, uh, there's a, uh, a growing number of uh, uh, experimental design, uh, experimental studies in hospitality and also tourism. Uh, however, what we can see here is the orange bar seems to be longer, and then the lumber actually is larger. What it means is hospitality studies are more frequently uh, using the experimental design than the tourism research. Right. Uh, of course, this, uh, this trend is until uh, uh, the first half of 2014. Uh, I think in the last few years, more experimental design uh, research uh, uh, has been published in uh, hospitality and tourism. Because of these observations, uh, finally, I want to take this opportunity. I hope you don't mind. Actually, I'll just uh, 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 10 seconds. Actually, uh, I and also my uh, partners, actually, uh, the other guest editors, including Duong and also Mariana, we are going to, uh, we are having actually a special issue in experimental research in tourism because of the observation that I just mentioned about. So uh, the deadline for the submission actually is uh, September 30th of this year. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in it, uh, if you're doing research, Experimental research in tourism. Welcome to submit it. All right, and that's all for my presentation. Thank you. All right, so thank you very much, Lawrence. It's uh, pretty interesting. I completely agree with you. Uh, the last slides that you talked about increasing number of experimental research and hospitality. Uh, even though I still think it's really not that much compared to other fields, and I think that can be a good topic to discuss in the future on why we do not really look into experimental research within hospitality and tourism, especially because most of the theories that we use are drawn from marketing or even like psychology. So yeah. I don't know why we don't do it, but it's a good topic to discuss in the future. All right, so uh, well done. We are all on time. Um, I was actually trying to put off my video again and again because I was moving around checking. Uh, there are multiple platforms. We are streaming this uh, panel discussion. So questions are coming from different places so i didn't want to bother people moving <laughs> so um all right so let's let's go with some questions initially my idea was to ask questions that i drafted uh, but since there are some other very interesting questions from the audience uh, i'll go with those questions first so that people can get their answers and if you have time left then i can ask the questions that i have okay so um now, one thing that I want to say, like while I was listening to maybe some of these things you have already touched upon, but I'm not sure if the people who asked these questions were there when you were talking about these things. So I'm going to just say those questions and you guys can answer those um, accordingly. All right, so um, the first question and this one I can understand because I've been asked this question a lot is about sample size. Uh, so normally, as I said, in hospitality, we do not really do a lot of experimental research. Many people use surveys. So sample size is something very important for many people, right? So even editors, reviewers always ask, like, how do you justify your sample size? So if you are using experimental research, what is an appropriate sample size? So if you can, you know, if each of you can just quickly talk about it. So maybe Sarah, since you are quiet for a long time. <laughs> Um, so sample size is a, an interesting question, um, depending on the, the method that you're using for collection. So I think Dr. J talked about power analysis, and that is really your starting point, is you have to determine kind of the anticipated effect size that you're working with, and then I would recommend running a power analysis that will indicate what sample size you should have around. Now that also, that's a great tool when you are working on a platform like MTurk or collecting online where you can select um, the sample size that you want. 
it does become a little bit more difficult when we're in the lab dealing with student samples. A lot of times our sample size is a function of accessibility and what is available for us at that time. So the power analysis, I like to say, is your absolute minimum that you should have. Um, and then it kind of can, can depend on the situation you're in and what you have accessible. Um, I will say from recent experience, at least in the marketing discipline, that there's been a push for increased sample sizes, particularly because we are trying to avoid dealing with, is it just that we don't have enough power and that the effect is randomly occurring? So what used to be acceptable, at least when I started my doctoral program, it was kind of considered about 25 per cell, was usually kind of okay um, in terms of getting enough power. That's increased where I've seen reviewers request about 50 per condition in a lab study, and I've actually been requested recently in terms of MTurk, they're wanting to see about 100 per cell, which is pretty big. Um, and again, that's just dealing with power issues and trying to ensure that the effects are not random. Um, that's kind of my take on it. Thank you very much, Sarah. Jay, do you have to anything you want to add to it? Yeah, a couple things. Um, I think that the power the, the power issues in sample size is going to continue to emerge as something important for researchers to consider. And I would encourage, especially anyone who may be like a graduate student or early in their career, it's something really important to familiarize yourself with. As Dr. Sarah was explaining, um, like when she was a graduate student, around 25 participants per experimental condition, like if you had a control group and then another group maybe rating how much they liked having access to like a coupon that gave you freedom of choice, that was considered something okay. Um, in psychology, that's rapidly changed. So in an experimental study with people in the lab now in psychology, if it's a very complex study that involves like brain imaging um, or just really complex data, maybe 30, 40, or 50 participants per condition will be acceptable. Um, in a study that just has people maybe looking at a stimulus on a computer screen and filling out a survey, most journals in psychology now would require a minimum of 150 participants per condition. I've seen 300 participants per condition is something not uncommon. For, for psychology, um, Mechanical Turk is a special problem because it's recognized that the data is relatively quick and easy to get. So I actually just saw a research article yesterday um, that was published this past uh, month or so, and their Mechanical Turk experiment had over 2,500 participants. So you're starting to see this issue. Um, if you want to really hedge your bets, and if you intend to publish your research or do an experiment, I encourage a power analysis. It's, I think it's complex for this talk, but let me show you one really great tool I love. It's called G-Power. And let me do a quick screen share just to show you what it looks like. And here it is. It should be sharing, I think. Oh, here we go. There it is. Um, so right here I have G Power pulled up. It's free. So if you just do a Google search for G Power in the help, I'll show you the information. And what you could do with G Power is you need to know your statistics a little bit, but what you could basically do here um, is identifying what type of statistics you might use. And then all you need to be able to do is know information about, for example, um, information about your sample size, for instance, and other information, and it will tell you what your statistical power actually would be with that study. Um, but a lot of journals now are requiring this power analysis. My last thought on that is if the power analysis is something confusing to you, find a statistician to team up with. I think that's becoming more and more common now in research. All right. Thank you very much, Jay. Um, yeah, G Power, it's an amazing, amazing tool. Uh, I use it as well, and I, I'm pretty sure that Lawrence also uses it as well as Sarah. So thank you again. Lawrence, do you have to anything, uh, do you have anything that you want to add to this uh, sample size stuff? Uh, yep. Uh, actually, uh, the, uh, Sarah and also Jay uh, mentioned about uh, we all know that usually for condition, uh, we have, the traditional one is uh, we have a uh, 25. 
And then uh, that's why when, I, when we designed the experiment, actually, uh, we have uh, over 30. Uh, but of course, this is not enough. Uh, it's better to have a more sample size. And I also agree that actually we need to use a, a, do a power analysis. And actually, Jay, you really uh, recall my memory about uh, using a G-Power. Uh, last time when I used the G-Power is um, when, uh, when I do the R&R. Yeah, that means when I uh, revise the paper. I still remember that um, in that paper, first of all, uh, I have two studies. And uh, the first study actually is based on the observation in the field. And then uh, because of the observation, and then we try to collect some data and then try to test it, uh, uh, collecting from the field. And right after that, we try to put it in the lab and see whether it works or not in a controlled environment. And then, okay, it's fine. We produce the two studies and, and we find uh, the conclusion actually converge. And then we submit it, however, the reviewer uh, actually complain that uh, uh, you better do uh, the power analysis. Yeah, and then uh, in this case, uh, because actually we cannot go back, right? And then, well, also, okay, fine. So that's why we try to check. Luckily, actually, uh, it's not bad. However, uh, because of the comments of the reviewer still, uh, we have to do an additional study, uh, study three. Yeah, so that's the reason why uh, I think G-Power is uh, important in this sense because uh, when we are planning for the third study, in this, at this stage, actually, it helps us to uh, justify the, the sample size for the first study. And then eventually, we finish it and then also find the same results. Uh, so eventually, the, the paper got published. Yeah. So I think power analysis would be something that, that uh, we should use uh, in order to uh, determine the sample size. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lawrence. Uh, now, uh, another question which uh, would be simpler, I guess, is uh, since uh, most of you talked about MTurk, Amazon MTurk, that you use it for data collection. Uh, Lawrence, I think you talked about Sona, which is in your campus. Uh, now, one the question that was asked was, uh, do you change platforms for data collection based on the type of experiment you are conducting, or it doesn't really matter? So Jay, do you want to talk about it? Uh, yeah, it depends on the nature of the study. Um, in psychology research, there's this really big criticism that most of the studies have been based on undergraduate college students, predominantly from the United States and Europe. Um, for a lot of things that we might study, like the attention process, I mean, that's really basic. And I don't know, if I make something wave behind my screen or whatnot, that'll probably capture almost anyone's attention regardless of cultural background. But attitudes towards like, for example, things in the hospitality industry, the type of message you convey to consumers, there's so many different things that'll actually influence people in different ways based on cultural norms and background. That's where the sampling becomes really important. So as Dr. Lawrence was kind of noting with, with his study, we're working with undergraduate students at, over in Macau, the question becomes, would people in the United States react the exact same way? Would people perhaps in China react the same way? Um, so when you start to get to these types of more complex, especially social phenomena that you're studying, then it becomes important to try to get a diverse sample. So in that type of situation, having access to an international sample of participants, which could be afforded through um, tools like maybe MTurk and some others that are similar would be really beneficial. So it really just depends on the nature of the sample that, that you're looking at. Uh, thank you, Jay. So because the time is limited, so I'm going to direct questions to one each of the panelists, like separately, so that we can cover most of the questions that were asked. Uh, so now, uh, Sarah, you did talk about MTurk quite in detail. Uh, so there was a question that said, what are some of the ways to ensure that manipulation worked on MTurk? How do you check that participants are attentive? Um, so that's kind of a, a, a double barrel question, two separate issues. Um, in terms of attention, we can use things what we would call attention check questions throughout the survey, which I hate to call them trick questions, but in a way they can be, where we are trying to lead the participant, sort of baiting them into an answer, um, needing them to read everything completely and understand it in order to select the correct one, if that kind of makes sense. Um, so we can embed those within the survey. And then, and then filter based on those if um, needed to see if they are actually paying attention. So that's kind of the, the easiest way. Um, in terms of the manip manipulation um, 
working, which can be related to if they are paying attention. We do include manipulation checks, again, after our primary variables measures. Um, so your manipulation checks can be done in a few different ways. We can have a question that, for instance, in the involvement study, that asks them simply, how involved did you feel in creating this trail mix? It's a very basic attention check question. We can also have other ones that are more um, even just binary in, in uh, the way that they're asked. So did you feel that you were very involved? Yes or no? So there's a few different ways that we can do that, but you definitely need to have those attention check questions throughout, um, not just at the end, because that's a, a thing that a lot of, I've noticed a lot of researchers are doing on MTurk is only putting attention check questions at the very end of their survey, which can be a problem. Um, we run into, it could be just respondent fatigue at the end and all our other responses are fine. So I do recommend, I know in a lot of my studies, we actually start with an attention check question to see if, are they actually paying attention from the get-go and we can eliminate them from the study at the beginning if they seem they're not paying attention. But again, uh, you wanna have those attention checks throughout and then manipulation check questions, um, again, after your primary um, measures. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, Lawrence, there's a question for you, which is actually directed to you regarding your study that you explained earlier. So the question is, um, is there any way to conduct an experiment for nonlinear effect? Uh, to be specific, like, can you conduct an experiment for nonlinear effect of monetary savings for coupons? Like by adding $7 saving or $12 mm -hmm. saving? Yeah, that's very that's that's a very good question. Actually, I think uh, yeah, well, as I mentioned before, in the next studies, actually you can do a lot of things. I think this is something we also uh, have thought of actually uh, because uh, at different levels of the monetary saving, actually the effect could be quadratic. Actually, yeah. So I think uh, yeah, it's totally possible. Yeah, in this sense. Okay, thank you very much, Lawrence. Uh, now, uh, Sarah, one question that came specifically for you was, um, uh, and again, I think it's about one of those studies that you were explaining, is how did you account for the fact that you might be measuring awareness of ingredients rather than involvement? Um, so I, th I think that question is more, are we manipulating awareness versus um, just their involvement? So. Part of that is when we created the stimuli for the two conditions, we do in both conditions highlight the ingredients that are in, in the trail mix itself. So in that particular study. So we do make a point of making them aware of what's in it, uh, similarly in both conditions. Um, so that would be my number one thing. We do also have of another study in this project that does go a little bit more into checking the awareness in terms of we have different numbers of ingredients. So we have three and then a six and then a nine um, condition, which would, in theory, if it was awareness, the effect um, shouldn't or should get stronger. Um, as you add more things, you become more aware of what's in it and we don't actually see that happening. So um, that's kind of how we've done it there. All right, thank you again, thank you very much. Uh, Jay, so uh, one question is for you and that is, uh, th this is not about your research but a general question which is, um, does social desirability bias affect experimental research design? Yeah, absolutely. That's just another example um, that people were always in our mind. So in research studies, what will end up happening is participants, if it's something controversial that you're researching, or if it's something where there are these kind of commonly held social attitudes. A good example of this is prejudice. Nobody wants to kind of say, yes, I'm prejudiced against a group of people. It's something that's socially frowned upon. So if you're studying something like that where people feel very defensive toward what you're measuring, what you're manipulating, studying. What you want to do to avoid the social desirability bias as much as possible is use some form of deception. Now your institutional review board or research ethics committee will probably need to, to evaluate your use of deception in some way, but what deception will involve is you just don't disclose what the experiment might really be about. So for example, in a study about prejudice, what I might do is say that this is going to be a study about social perception, 
not prejudice. And then I maybe present people with maybe different kind of short, maybe resumes from different candidates. Maybe one candidate is one race, another candidate is another race, or it could be different genders. And then I have people rate the candidates and they're not aware that I'm really trying to take a look. Are you prejudiced or biased toward one race or gender or the other? Um, so that's one common way we get around it. The deception like this requires some careful thought. Real briefly, one other way we could use deception is we could use basically some fake surveys and have the real survey questions embedded within the fake ones. So if you have questions about prejudicial attitudes that you're really studying, you could embed them into all kinds of other social questions. And the idea is that this will throw people off to the fact that you're really studying prejudice. But there are, again, ethical concerns um, with these type of studies. Thank you very much, uh, Jay. Um, Lawrence, I have one question for you very quick. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, uh, since there are a lot of control variables included in, included in experimental research design, right? So um, the question is, do you think experiments lead to artificial results? If yes, how do you deal with it? Sorry? Do you think I mean, what? Do you think experiments lead to artificial results because you are controlling so many things? Uh, if yes, how do you deal with it or how do you justify it? Artificial re uh, results, actually, uh, I think, it, again, depends on the ethics of the researchers. I think all the researchers already set a hypothesis and already designed the experiment. As long as they strictly follow everything and then um, the results is there, and then I think uh, the results is actually true and it is nothing about uh, artificial. Yeah, uh, I, of course, uh, I understand what you mentioned about is about the query. If we add, let's say, uh, one more query and then perhaps the result would be very different. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, and then actually, uh, what we did actually is uh, we tried to uh, propose, actually, be, before we do the experiment, we tried to uh, propose some of the uh, uh, covariates and then we also try to include them and then to see whether it, uh, it generates the results or not. This is what we strictly follow. So that, mm -hmm. and that's the, that's the results. And uh, of course, I think uh, in some of the science field, uh, now what they are doing is uh, uh, they have something what we call the uh, pre-registration. Uh, but what I think uh, now in the social science field, uh, it is not very common. I, I don't know, psychology or, or, or marketing, it, it seems not, still not very common, but uh, in medical science and also in something about electoral science, uh, nowadays, they use uh, pre-registration to prevent some, this kind of uh, a potential problem. Thank, Thank you very much, Lawrence. Yes, Sarah. That, sorry. Um, I think when we're talking about artificial results on top of what Dr. Lawrence touched on is this idea that if we're doing experiments, are we controlling for so many factors that we really take away the generalizability or the external validity mm -hmm. of our results? And I think that's a really valid point. And for me personally, I have kind of two things um, that I try to implement on that. One is that I think our first experiment that you do when you're searching for that main effect is going to be tightly controlled, meaning that we are controlling for a lot of factors because we want to establish does this effect happen. But as we run additional studies, that's where we should see that increase in external validity. And I think that as we increase the number of studies. So if I'm having a three study paper, having replication under different conditions is a way of addressing that issue that these res this, this effect does occur and it occurs under different conditions. Um, and, and my last point on that is also the increased usage of field experiments, which I think are a wonderful way to, again, increase that generalizability of your findings. So I hate hearing when people automatically assume that experimental research is kind of, oh, well, it happened in a lab, it's not real life. Um, we have to start somewhere in controlling for other factors to see what's going on, but there, the, the way we develop our research study should address that idea that this effect does, does occur in, in uh, practical situations. Thank you very much, Sarah. Now, there's one other thing which I think would be the last topic that we can talk about since we have five, six minutes left, and that's about student samples. So now, again, uh, I'll put my, you know, reviewer cap or my training cap as a hospitality researcher. 
Um, normally, many people do not like student samples in hospitality research. So again, it's not a generalized statement, but most of the times if you are using a student sample, there are a lot of questions raised on it. Um, so now in your discipline, so again, uh, I would not ask Lawrence to talk about it first because me and Lawrence are sort of both from the yeah. same discipline, but I would like to know, is it a norm in your discipline? So Jay, uh, what do you think, like, is student sample really something that's acceptable in psychology or do you have to provide additional justifications? Um, going back to like an, an earlier response to a question, it depends on the nature of your study. If mm -hmm. you're studying more basic cognitive processes that are very similar between people or uncontrollable factors like personality, for example, um, student samples in general work pretty well because they're very similar. But when you start getting into more complex things like social phenomena or attitudes about you know, monetary spending and finance, these type of things, um, student samples are what we actually call in psychology weird. Because we know at any university in the world, students tend to be often more affluent, they often have had more educational access, their parents have often attained more. They're just an unusual sample. Um, now, just to kind of hedge this briefly, in psychology, at least, it is acceptable to do research involving students. But what we often have to do is if we carry out a study involving students initially, we then have to back up our results by then using a much broader and more diverse sample. So it's very common in psychology to do an initial study involving students in a lab setting and then carry out a broader sample with MTurk or other type of things or vice versa, depending on exactly what you're manipulating. All right, thank you. Now, Sarah, before you answer this question for marketing, I um, because somebody just sent a specific scenario for like a marketing study involving student samples. So I'm just gonna read that. So when you answer, please take this into consideration. So this is like, um, again, the same question about student samples, but it goes like this. So for example, we are running a study on brand failures and its effect on buying intentions in automotive sector. Our sample is students. We are going to manipulate the sample with scenarios. However, to prevent their old perceptions, we are going to use a fictional car brand. Is it possible to use student sample for such a study because many students might not have a car, but we ask them to assume that they have our fictional car? Okay, so there would be a couple of things that I think you could do here. I think if a student sample is what you have access to, I mean, sometimes that's what it comes down to is do you, what you have access to. And I think that the design of your study in terms of the scenarios that you use could potentially address their limited experience with cars, um, depending how you want to frame the scenario itself. So I think it can be done. You can also include questions about, do they own a car? Have they owned a car beforehand? So that may either be a covariate or it may be an eligibility requirement in your study. So you may ask or only include students who own a car. I think at the very minimum, if you are going to use a student sample, just like Jay said, that you want to follow this up with a second study, maybe using MTurk, where you can use car ownership as an eligibility requirement to then kind of follow up and ensure that you can replicate your results and again, increase that external validity um, of what you're finding. But again, it comes down to accessibility. And if that's what you have access to, I don't think it's a bad way to start um, examining your, your research question. All right, thank you very much, Lawrence. So while you answer this question, I would also ask you, because I'm personally interested to know this, have you ever had problems using experimental research design in particular, uh, also the student samples for your studies? If yes, how, how did you deal with it or how did you justify it? I think this is a very common problem, actually, encountered by the researchers here in the hospitality and tourism. Uh, uh, actually, I've also heard of that uh, my, my friends, when they submit a paper uh, to hospitality and tourism journals, and they just use a student sample, actually, uh, they've got rejected. I think, uh, uh, going back to the uh, first message that I uh, talked about uh, at the beginning of the seminar, actually, is uh, because in our field, actually, uh, practical and also theoretical significance are equally important. If we can only provide implication based on student samples, 
actually it's hard to convince uh, the reviewers and also the editor that actually it could have a significant uh, uh, implication, practical, practical implications. So um, in this case, especially when I'm doing experiment, actually, uh, even though I do it in the lab with uh, undergraduate students, uh, I, I will also try to do additional studies, uh, trying to test it in uh, different samples, uh, mm -hmm. especially if my, uh, I wanted to submit it to uh, hospitality and also to some uh, uh, journals. I think uh, this is also very important, as uh, Sarah also mentioned about the replications, and then see uh, whether the results can be replicated in a different samples or not. Yeah, so, uh, so I think this could be the, the reason why actually if we only have student samples, we got rejected. Yeah. Thank you very much, Lawrence. One last question, because this person who asked the question asked me again to please ask us questions. <laughs> so, uh, and then we can uh, finish the panel. So the question is, defining attributes is a very important part of experimental design. Can we obtain them through other ways except for interviews? Uh, I don't know if it made a sense or not, but um, like anybody can answer this, Sarah, Jay, Lawrence. If for me, I'm, I'm, um, the word attributes is what I'm wondering. So the attributes, can we obtain them from something other than interviews? Um, what that's making me think of is, is the data. And if, if that's what the, the question refers to, uh, there are many different ways to get data. So real briefly, the common ones I think will be interested to everyone. We could use interviews in the sense where people give open-ended feedback to a question. So for one study I did is we asked people what spirituality means to them. And then they had a free response and we were able to do some analyses there. Um, the open response takes a lot more work though to be able to extract the data. The alternative is to use surveys, which I think most of us have used. There are a lot of nuances and tricks to using surveys though as well. Um, so those are two ways. There are also other ways we could use. There's one in psychology, I think they would be interested in hospitality um, and, and, and marketing, and that's called experience sampling. And that's where people wear these devices, for example, that take photos of what they're doing, either in the lab or in their daily life. So you could do a field experiment where maybe they go to a restaurant, for example, and it takes these little snapshots. And what the participants do is they maybe fill out a survey in response to the images. And they do this independent. So if there's maybe an accidental photo of them in the bathroom, you never see it. It's nothing that's going to embarrass them. So that's another kind of technique to get data. But I mean, there are a lot of rich techniques out there and available, not just surveys and interviews. Thank you very much, Jay. Sarah, you have to, uh, do you have anything to add to this? Um, I'm actually just reading, I, I see we're getting some clarification on what they mean by attributes. Um, okay. I mean, the items that they will provide to us later on, like lower high levels of coupons. So I think it might probably be the conditions that uh, he's referring to. Um, <clears throat> to just trying to, to understand exactly what they're, they're asking. Because um, I agree with what Jay was saying that there are different methods of asking questions and getting different types of data in terms of how in depth you want to go as well in the response. Um, if it's in terms of um, diff or creating the different conditions, I mean, that depends on what your, your variables are that you're including. Um, so I'll, I'll go back to the example I presented in terms of involvement. In general, what we're, the attribute we're looking at is involvement. Now we chose to make it um, dichotomous in a low versus a high, but we can certainly divide that level of involvement up in different levels as well. So we could have a, a low, a moderate, and a high as well. I think it depends on um, what your research question is and what your hypotheses are in terms of deciding how many levels you need to have and how to create them. Um, the one thing I will, I will highlight on, and I know Jay talked about it, and I, I saw us all nodding when this came up, was just ensure that you know how you're going to analyze your data um, as you design your experiment um, and choose your conditions, because I think we've all fallen into that trap before. Um, so I don't know if that answered the question, but that's kind of my take on it. 
Thank yes. you very much. Uh, Lawrence, do you want to add yes. anything to this? Yes, uh, maybe the last message, actually. Yes. Uh, regarding a condition, I think, uh, again, because uh, in the field of hospitality, we will also consider the uh, real world application as well. Uh, interview, I think, uh, is, would be one of the approach to do it. Like, for example, in the Q.1, if, let's say, uh, I know the owner of the sandwich house, perhaps I can talk to him. And then what kind of uh, uh, monetary saving uh, are you going to offer? All right, what kind of, uh, are you going to offer freedom of choice or not? Actually, in this case, then the condition can be developed by the, uh, the, the managers. And then uh, we can also test it. In this case, we can also provide some practical implications for him. Another thing, one last message, which I can tell is, uh, I think we can also try to use our observation as well. Yeah, because we can be a cus customers, consumers, and then we can observe, and then we can, just like for me, when we uh, try to develop the coupon uh, research, actually, I collect a lot of coupons points from different restaurants, and then trying to make it, uh, making it make sense, actually, when we are developing uh, the, the conditions. Yeah, this is something I want to add on. Yeah. Thank you very much, Lawrence. And uh, in the name of being fair to you, because you are very far and it's really late there, I think we have to stop, even though I have like a bunch of questions that I drafted, but it's okay, no problem. I can always bug you people through email. Uh, and then probably because the, um, you know, the turnout was very good. There were people who have been here like for all this time uh, perhaps we might even you know conduct another online panel discussion only answering questions that people might have in their research methods or research design now um i think that's all from me dr jehan do you want to add anything to this yeah, I, I also would like to thank uh, lawrence j sarah for for your time i appreciate it also faizan to you as well for putting this wonderful panel i want to remind everybody who's online or who may be watching this later that all of these videos are stored on Anna Hay website or M3 Center at USF website. They are free of charge. So feel free to reach out to the panelists also too. If you have a question throughout the video that they may say, oh, why did I not ask this? You can, I'm sure that they all will welcome your. And also I would like to encourage everybody to uh, collaborate with each other. I mean, I, I had great ideas that I didn't know what Sarah was working earlier. And Lawrence, we just started working on one paper, but Jay, we already talked about collaborating. So that's wonderful. And also, Sarah, maybe uh, Faisan and I have been talking about this for a long time, but we may be doing another panel on Mechanical Turk by itself. You know, I just want to tell that we did a fake study uh, that uh, on a software program that doesn't exist. And we got a lot of responses on Mechanical Turk. So maybe it's very good idea to have a panel or maybe even an article to prevent, you know, from researchers falling into traps, you know, because there's a lot of, you know, overcomes. But that's for future. But again, thank you to all of you. And thanks, Faizan. Uh, for doing this. Have a wonderful day to all of you. Uh, one other thing I want to add here again, like after thanking everybody, since we are trying to promote different things like research methods and stuff, and we've been very lucky having all these amazing scholars who are willing to, you know, share their knowledge and experience with everybody else. And we've also got emails, people thanking us for putting this together, for not having access to many amazing speakers, right? So if anybody who is listening is good at something or if they know anybody who is good at a certain research method or anything new or unique, please reach out and we will arrange a webinar or a panel or whatever so that uh, you can talk to a larger audience and many people can benefit from your knowledge and experience. The more you share, the more you gain. Right, that's our motto for the organization. Thank you again. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you, Shia and Faisal.